Welcome to the Continuum Lab. So I made it back from the holidays after a really heavy excess of food and drink and silly hats and merriness in general. Uh, I managed to pick up a nasty little virus along the way, so a sore throat and fever and that kind of thing. So I hope that doesn't mess up my voice too much for this. Anyway, today I'm going to show you how I made this capacitive keyboard. Before you start commenting below that this is old news and that I already made several of these, this one is different. If you've been following along in these videos, then you will immediately be able to spot the differences in materials and construction from earlier models. This is the specific keyboard that we make in my Continuum Lab workshops that I'm currently offering to schools and other institutions. So what I've gone for here is a new DIY structure for the instrument, as well as easy repeatability. So what does that even mean? Well, I'm about to show you, so let's go. A lot of the instruments from my original Control Freak video series, as well as for my workshop at the Maker Fair, were made out of recycled boxes. This is an excellent solution, which makes the build quite a lot easier, because the basic structure is already taken care of. But of course, then you need a box. So what do you do if you don't have one on hand? Well, then it's time to get creative. If you saw the previous video here on the Continuum Lab channel, then you know that I love corrugated cardboard. I was able to fold the body of this instrument, my recorder MIDI controller, out of a single piece of double corrugated cardboard, and it works great. So let's see if we can do something similar for this keyboard. First, we need a piece of cardboard which is roughly 20 by 30 centimeters. Notice that the wave pattern in the corrugation is different sizes on one side and the other. We'll start out by using the larger size to measure out some sections. First count out three waves and then mark that position like this. Then we make another section four waves wide like this. The next section is where the keys for the keyboard go, so we'll make it wide enough for two rows of keys. Roughly 10 centimeters should do it, but you might want to make it larger or smaller. There, that will be the width of each row of keys. Looks good to me. Let's clean that up. Then we mark off another section of four waves like this. Now we have two equal sections here and here, which will make up the front and rear wall of the keyboard structure. And another section roughly 10 centimeters across, which will go opposite from the section with the keys. Now we expand each of those marks that we made crushing one side of the corrugation like this. That will weaken the structure of the cardboard along these nice straight lines, allowing me to make some perfectly straight bends like that. Take care to only bend along the lines so that we get nice square corners and a good overall shape. Cool. That's the rough shape of the keyboard right there. The pieces here at the base will be like a lid and a latch to hold that lid in place. That'll become clear in a moment. The latch or lip doesn't need to run the full length of the instrument, so I'll mark off the section that I want to keep and then cut off the rest. There. This is how that's going to work. Except that the lid section is still a bit too wide, so the instrument is kind of trapezoid shaped when viewed from the side. We want a nice rectangular shape, so we'll have to take off a bit of the lid. Something like that. Nice, that's more like it. Now that everything is cut to size, it's time to start gluing it in place. I'm using my trusty glue gun, which is fast and easy to use. To hold the bends in position, I place three or four globs of glue along the inside of the bend. Then I make the bend and hold it in place while the glue sets. There, that seems solid enough. The bend on the lid is not glued because it has to move and work as a hinge. The two main bends should be at right angles, which will put the edge of the lid right up to the section with the latch or lip on it, like that. The latch piece itself should have a sharper bend in it, so I'll bend it beyond 90 degrees, leaving kind of a hook shape. Also notice that I'm being a bit more generous with the glue here, because this part needs to withstand the manipulation of repeatedly opening and closing the instrument. But now the lid is unable to pass the latch, so I'll bend it back and forth a bit to weaken it. And now it works. By pushing the edge of the lid beyond the latch, it's caught behind it. To open the instrument, it's the same operation. Just pull the lid beyond the edge of the lip and voila! That works great. Very satisfying to operate. Will it last forever? Probably not. But if that was what I wanted, then I wouldn't have made the instrument out of cardboard to begin with. I'm prototyping here and in that context, I'm super happy with this. Okay, time to get started on the keys. To make them, I found this electrical tape, which is cheap and comes in lots of colors, black and white included. The tape is around 19 mm wide, which is more or less right for what I want. That will be the width of each key, and the length of them will simply be half of this surface here, which means around 5 cm per key. My original MIDI keyboard had a single strip of transparent tape covering all the copper tape of the keys together. 
So no individual colored tape for each key. That would be a nice upgrade on this new one. Something else that I also want to try is to make some of the keys out of conductive paint. That way there's no soldering and also it's just fun in different ways to the copper tape. Not better, just different. So what I'm going to do is use the copper tape for the white key section and the conductive paint for the rest of the keys up here, which are the black keys. I know that my full key surface here is 20 centimeters wide, so I'll be able to fit 10 widths of this tape on here for 10 keys plus a one millimeter gap for each. That's perfect for what I need. In fact, I'll just use the tape itself to measure out the whole thing. Perfect. The rest of the keys are even easier because I can use the first row to measure them out like that. I'll just draw in the black keys for reference there. Okay, let's have a look inside. Oh, almost forgot that lid, nice. So I'll have to stick some electronics in here to make everything work and luckily I have just the thing. This is my Team CLC breakout board, which I designed specifically to help me build my instrument prototypes. Combined with the Team CLC microcontroller itself, it makes the electronic side of the project relatively easy. I'll also need one of these multiplexer modules, which is going to help me to easily connect the 16 keys at the same time. It plugs in right here, and there's actually room for another one right next to it. The idea is to then plug the individual sensors into these 16 pins here using these jumper wires. One end is stripped bare so that I can solder or paint on it. Let's get on with it. First, I'm going to stick the breakout board into place here somewhere. Let's see, maybe here on the side where I'll have easy access to the micro USB. Bit of hot glue. There. Then plug in the multiplexer. That'll go here in the opposite side where the keys are and the flexible cable will help with that. Then I'll just stick that down as well with some more hot glue and then we can get on with the keys. Try not to use huge quantities of hot glue, that way it's easier to reuse the electronics for the next prototype. Hmm, now the multiplexer is kind of in the way of my beautiful lid mechanism. Maybe I can just cut down the latch a bit and try to adjust everything that way. Uh, okay, I mean it kind of works, but the problem will be worse once I plug the cables into the multiplexer, which will make it a lot taller. I'll leave it for now and then have another look at it once I get the cables in there. Okay, enough about that. Let's make some keys. I'll start with the white keys, so that means the copper tape. First I'll need to cut out some pieces of a suitable size. Something like that. No, maybe a little bit narrower. I don't want the pieces to be right up against each other because then it's too easy to accidentally press two instead of one. Around 12 millimeters wide then. Let's make 10 of those there. Next I'll solder one of the cables to each of the keys. I'll need the soldering iron and some solder. First, get a bit of solder on the end of each key. This will make it very easy to solder the cable on there as you're about to see. Touch the cable end to the solder on the key. Wait for a couple of seconds for the solder to melt. Slide the iron off the side and you're done. Then do nine more. I should have tinted the cables as well, which would make this even easier. But even so, the copper tape really is very easy to solder to. If you've never soldered before, this is a good place to start. Now I'll need to perforate the cardboard next to each key to pass the cables through. This small paintbrush looks like it will make about the right size hole. Let's see, we'll want to put the holes slightly down the side of the instrument so that the cables are out of the way of the key surface itself. I'll just quickly mark the position of each one, then make an initial hole with this professional hole making tool and then finally make the holes larger with the brush. Okay, that's probably a bit overkill, but whatever. Now I can pull the cable through like this and then plug it into the multiplexer right here. Then I just peel the covering off the back of the copper tape and stick it into place. I'll make sure to leave a neat gap around the key with the cable off the end of the top surface. What I also like to do is to put a bit of glue in the cable hole, which will stabilize the cable so that it doesn't pull on the copper tape when we move the other end around inside the instrument. I like to make things look nice, but it is by no means my first priority here. If you want beautiful, then make it beautiful, as long as you don't forget to make it functional as well. Making sure the tape is on straight and without folds and other imperfections will improve both the look and the functionality. Okay, everything's plugged in, let's have a look at it. Hmm, now the cables on the multiplexer make it even harder to close the lid. I'll have to fix that in a bit. But for now, just check out those keys. Looks great. Let's put on the electrical tape. Make sure not to stretch this tape before sticking it down. That will make it loosen as it contracts. I make each strip of tape long enough to reach down over the edge of the instrument and cover the cable hole. These keys are capacitive sensors, so the electrical tape is what's called the dielectric layer. 
All capacitive sensors need one of these to isolate direct electrical conduction with your finger while allowing the electrical field to be measured, which is what a capacitive sensor does. There, still looking good. Well, good enough. Now for the black keys. Again, I'll start by poking a hole for a cable behind each key, again expanding each one. And again, that's probably overkill. Better to just make your holes right the first time around. Now let's get out the conductive paint. There's no real secret to using this stuff, just paint whatever size electrode you need. The paint itself is conductive, so whatever continuous area you paint will be conductive as well. I'll squeeze out a bit of paint on each key area and then use the paintbrush to extend it to the area that I need. Try to get it more or less flat, which will make everything neater and also help the paint to dry evenly. Next I'll draw the cables through, gluing each one in place inside its hole. I try to bend each cable into position so that it's as close to the painted area as possible because the paint won't hold the cable in place like the solder does on the copper tape on the white keys. Finally, I'll put an extra blob of paint on top of each cable end to make sure I get a good connection. And now to let everything dry. I'll be back in 10 minutes. Okay, let's have a look at this. Yeah, that's more or less dry. Good enough. Let's get out the black tape. Again, just like with the white keys, cover the paint and try to keep everything more or less neat or even very neat if that's something you care about. Make the tape pieces a bit longer than the keys so that they can be folded down over the cable hole as well. Cool, that's looking pretty good. Now it's time to plug in the cables for the black keys. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm feeling pretty stupid right now. I seem to have plugged the 10 white keys into positions 1 to 10, which is wrong. The order of the cables should follow the order of the notes on the piano, so like this, with the black keys interspersed. C, C sharp, D, D sharp, etc. I'll have to unplug everything and start over. It would probably be a good idea to number the cables so that I don't lose my place while I go through these. Let's see. Okay, that should make it much easier. Numbering sensors for reference is always a good idea, especially if you have a few of them, like here. Okay, that looks correct. Let's close this back up. Oh, almost forgot. I'll have to do something about that lid. I think the simplest solution is to just move the multiplexer. So I'll just pull it loose from here and then glue it back in over here on the inside wall. That should leave it out of the way of the lid and everything else. Couple of drops of glue, hold the multiplexer in place while it sets, and you're done. And now the lid closes and opens perfectly again. Mmm, nice. I don't think that'll ever grow old. There's still one more sensor to connect, and that's the calibration button, which will go right here. All of my instruments have one of these, because it allows me to calibrate the instrument to the specific size and setup of the sensors that I end up making. Larger and smaller capacitive sensors have a different output range, so this is important to take into account. Just like on the other sensors, I cut a hole for the cable, then pull the cable through, plug it in, and then I glue the button module into place. There, looks nice. And that's it. The keyboard is now fully functional. All that's left to do is connect the USB cable, and then bring this instrument over to the computer, plug it in, put some code on it, and then I can make some noise. Let's do it. The sketch that I need is on the Continuum Lab GitHub page, this one here, and it's very similar to the code on the other keyboards that I made in the past. The most notable change is that it now has comments, which explain the different steps and functions and so on. So I'll download that from here, and then upload it to the instrument using Arduino. Then of course I need to calibrate the sensors by pressing the calibration button and keeping it pressed while I activate all the other sensors one by one. Then I open up the Yoshimi software synthesizer and connect the keyboard and the synth through jack. And now I'm ready to play. There. I hope you can appreciate how well that works, considering that it was basically glued and painted together on a single piece of corrugated cardboard. The touch sensitivity of the capacitive sensors is excellent, and the whole thing works equally well as a polyphonic and as a monophonic keyboard. There's tons of things that can be done to expand on this concept. For example, I could double the number of keys by incorporating a second multiplexer module, or I could include a 
capacitive pitch bend interface, or I could even add a DIY breath sensor and turn this into a kind of MIDI melodica, like I did with my very first uh, MIDI keyboard. But this is the basic model. It's deliberately simple because it's one of the instruments that I feature in my Continuum Lab workshops. This is the second in a series of four videos which showcase these workshop instruments. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss that, then you should definitely subscribe to the Continuum Lab channel right here on YouTube and also go find the Continuum Lab over on Instagram. I post more interesting projects like this one regularly. And if you're interested in hosting one of my workshops at your school or event, then get in touch with me for more information. And that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Take care until next time and I'll see you in the continuum.